21-year-old Ramona Moore was born to Guyanese immigrants and lived in Brooklyn, New York. She was on the dean's list at Hunter College, majored in psychology, and was described as young, beautiful, and upbeat. She worked part-time as a receptionist and hung out in the local library, dreaming of a career in research. Shy and introverted and away from her family, she never partied, and as far as her mother knew, she never had a boyfriend. Around 7 p.m., Ramona told her mother, Ellie Carmichael, that she was going to a Burger King half a block away and headed out the door. But strangely, she never returned. The next morning, around 9 a.m., her mother reported Ramona missing. She explained to the officers that Ramona was a delicate child who just registered for summer classes the day before and was a successful student who never missed a lecture, so it was very uncharacteristic for her to leave and not return or call home. Ramona never did sleepovers and called her mother whenever she would change locations. She also told them she called Ramona's friend, Gary Williams, who said he stopped by her apartment before leaving for Burger King, and he hasn't heard from her since. They told her to call again once it's been 24 hours, because they can't take action for someone who isn't 16 until then. As directed, she did at 7 p.m., and an officer responded that Ramona is 21 years old and could be anywhere with her boyfriend and to never call again. Angered at the response, her mother showed up to the precinct the next morning with four family members, complaining about how she was treated the night before. She asked if they could call Gary's house to see if something went wrong, to which they responded they couldn't because she was 21. This officer then told her, Ma'am, you can check to see how many missing persons there are. Do you think we can look for everyone? Frustrated, she continued to fight to find Ramona and contacted politicians, and the police finally bowed to political pressure and officially opened an investigation on April 28th. By the time police started their search, it was too late. Ramona's mother received an anonymous call the day before Mother's Day, where a man said he found her number through the missing posters and heard screams coming from a house on Snyder Avenue. He added that he believed she was dead and her body was wrapped up in plastic. That afternoon, in two weeks since she went missing, her body was found wrapped in a blanket under an ice cream truck. Ramona was so badly disfigured that she had to be identified by dental records. The autopsy report captured a brutal murder. She endured a shattered jaw, cheekbones, and facial bones. It also reported broken ribs, a fractured hip bone, a broken nose, and saw cuts to her hands and feet. Her face appeared to have been beaten with a hammer with cigarette burns to her face and eyelids. After the tip, police went to the address provided by the anonymous caller, but it didn't exist. They began knocking on nearby homes, and when they reached one residence, a man pulled out a gun and a standoff ensued immediately after he recognized the police. The man, 22-year-old Troy Hendricks, eventually surrendered and police took him into custody. While in custody, police learned Troy was the suspect in the essay of a 15-year-old girl who escaped from his house earlier that day. According to the 15-year-old who escaped, she said she was tied up to a chair and essayed repeatedly by two men in a house on Snyder Avenue. When the men fell asleep from being too intoxicated, she chewed through the duct tape on her mouth and squeezed her ankles out of the shoelaces tied around her chair and escaped. At first, she saw his grandmother in the house and woke her up to explain what she went through in the basement to which she said she would not help her. The girl then tried to run, but the grandmother came behind her and started screaming, which woke the men up, and she ran up the balcony steps. What think happened with the girl that woke you up? I don't know what happened to her. Did anybody ever tell you what happened to her? No. They, they don't tell me much around here. They protect me. They keep me 
in the dark. How about right before that? Was there another door right before that? that you saw? A couple days before? No, I didn't see anybody then. One of the men came behind her and they fell together, so she screamed for help, but he kept covering her mouth. She eventually freed herself again and made a police report. However, she mentioned that while she was kidnapped, the men told her that if she did not cooperate with them, then she would end up dead like the girl they had last night. With tape over her mouth and eyes and tied to a chair, they said the girl's body was behind her, twisted her head and said, smell that, smell that, that's the dead body. She said she smelt something funny and believed they were telling the truth. Around the same time, a 19-year-old man named Ramondo Jack talked to the police about a visit he made to Troy Hendricks' house around the time that Ramona disappeared. He claimed to have seen Ramona alive before she died and started seeing her face in his sleep, which prompted him to speak. He said he was childhood friends with Troy and used to live across the street from him. Both Troy and his friend, 24-year-old Kason Pearson, were both members of the Bloods gang. One day, Ramondo was in the neighborhood because his sister was throwing a baby shower for his fiance and decided to pop in on Troy. While Ramondo was in the house, he engaged in small talk with Troy and Kason before they began boasting about how they snatched a girl up off the streets, beat her up, and are messing her up in the basement. He was in disbelief, and the men proceeded to lift their shirts, which showed bloodstained t-shirts. Still in disbelief, they took him to the basement. Troy told Ramona, say what's up, lifted a pillowcase off her head, and Ramondo was horrified at what he saw. He said Ramona was lying there wearing a t-shirt and underwear with bruises and bandages on her hands and feet. She had a bloody gash in the middle of her face and a swollen eye. The webbing between her fingers were cut. She had three cigarette burns that formed a triangle under one eye, and she had a chain around her neck. The men forced her to tell Ramonda what they've done to her, and she recounted that the two men dragged her off the sidewalk and into the apartment. When she attempted to fight them off, they beat her up. Her voice was weakened from crying when she told the gruesome details of the essay she endured and how they had her in a fetal position with her hands behind her back and a chain on her neck when they attempted to saw her hands and feet off. Troy then asked her why they did this and she responded that they did it for fun. Ramona was then asked what's the difference between them and Ramondo. She looked at him and said, I think he is a nice guy and I believe he's going to help me. Unfortunately, Ramondo did nothing. After the visit, he attended his baby shower and returned to Maryland without reporting to the police. His reason for not calling the police was because he was scared of retribution from the men and wasn't confident the police would protect him. Yeah, they said I should have run them to the police. They talking because they never been in that predicament. So anybody could talk off of words if they're not in that predicament. But wait till y'all get in that predicament, then y'all see. I didn't know if I were to say something that they wouldn't have called somebody on the street because they got friends. That's why I ain't do it. That's why I ain't call the cops as soon as I left. Because I was scared. I was scared. He then saw news of a survivor who escaped from a house on Snyder Avenue and believed it was Ramona. He thought for a second his uncle told the police and felt peace before he quickly realized it was regarding the second victim. Ramona was held and tortured for three days before she was unalived. The prosecutor later stated that the men turned to Ramona and asked, how do you want to die before beating her face in with a hammer? Had Ramondo called the police, perhaps Ramona would have been found alive and the 15 year old girl would have been safe. The police believe the anonymous caller was the uncle, and the screams they heard were likely from the 15-year-old and not Ramona. Both admissions helped police realize that their cases were connected and initiated the hunt for Kason Pearson as he was on the run. 
Eventually, friends of Quezon were disgusted by the news about his crimes and gave an address of where he was hiding. The police soon found him in a Yonkers apartment. He wanted the cops to end him and barricaded himself in the bedroom with a knife at the officers. In this standoff, police shot him once in the leg and they were able to arrest him. Both men were charged with five counts of first-degree murder, along with the kidnapping, essay, and torture of Ramona, and faced separate charges for the attack on the second victim. On the first day of testimony, and while the 15-year-old testified, all hell broke loose. Kason Pearson came into court with a hidden shank, a makeshift plexiglass knife, and stabbed his lawyer in the chin while Troy Hendricks jumped over the defense table and went for a court officer's gun. Reports claim that Kason and Troy winked at each other before attempting their violent escape out the courtroom. After Troy was subdued, he told the court that he wasn't going to hurt anybody, but actually harm himself. Kason's lawyer was taken to the hospital where he received stitches and at least seven court officers were injured. The judge dismissed the jury and called a mistrial as they were tainted by what they saw and could not be able to render a fair verdict. Kason Pearson told a stunned courtroom, we did it for fun. It was fun to see a system that had so much power and control lose it in a second. The judge was running away, bumping his knee. That day was the most fun I had in my entire life. In addition to their initial charges, they were charged with assault, attempted escape, and criminal possession of a weapon. A new trial was quickly rescheduled a month later. On March 24th, both men were found guilty of all charges. During their sentencing the following month, the judge threw a book at the men while calling them worse than animals as he handed down the maximum sentence of life without the possibility of parole plus 22 years for their attempted escape attacks. The men maintained their innocence until the very last minute and with attitude. After the end of her daughter's trial, Ellie Carmichael filed a civil rights lawsuit against the NYPD, alleging that they have a practice of not making prompt investigations of missing persons claims for African Americans while making prompt investigations for white individuals. Less than two months before Ramona Moore vanished, Svetlana Aronov, the white wife of a doctor, went missing on the Upper East Side. The day after Arnav vanished, police launched a massive search for her in the Cocker Spaniel BIM she had taken for a walk. The NYPD called a press conference, assigned two dozen detectives to the case full-time, and went door-to-door, -door, passing out flyers with pictures of Arnav and BIM on them. The cops traced her phone and bank records and analyzed surveillance tapes gathered from stores and apartment buildings near her home. A police van posted with the department's 800 tip line number drove around her neighborhood, blaring details of her disappearance over a loudspeaker. A letter was sent to Rare Books Dealer, a business the Arnavs dabbled in. Detectives reportedly even consulted a psychic. A bloodhound was assigned to track Bim's scent. Eventually, Arnav's body surfaced in the East River. It was never determined whether she fell, jumped, or was pushed into the water. Ellie said, if this was a white kid, they would never have done this. I had to say to the detectives one day, you know I feel the same emotions and pain as a white person. My daughter is dead. I know she endured physical torture, but the police, the police put us through mental torture. Dealing with the police was more of a nightmare than finding Ramona's body. By then, she says, she has resigned herself to the fact that Ramona was dead. But the police, they were just nasty. How are you feeling all over the circumstances? I just want to let you know, in all honesty, Detective Carey is a good man and worked very hard with this case. He was very nasty. He was nasty to us. Well, 
In 2014, the federal district judge dismissed her bias case, stating a lack of evidence that systemic bias was shown. Since then, Ramona's law was discussed at one hearing before the City Council's Public Safety Committee in December 2004 and hasn't been brought up since. At the end of the trial, Ramona's mother said, I'm not happy with a lot of things, but I'm happy with the sentence. Ramona's case displayed simultaneous systemic justice and injustice. The same system that imprisoned her killers did not search for her while she was being unalived. The full investigation was captured on NYPD's 24-7's fourth episode linked in the bio. May Ramona's family receive eternal peace and the accountability they deserve for the handling of this case. May Ramona rest peacefully and beautifully in paradise and may the second victim find healing and ease in their journey. And thank you all for watching. <laughs>